Hello. This paper is the philosophy of law. The module is enforced medical treatment. The objectives of this module are to understand the legal and philosophical principles supporting enforced medical treatment. The author of this module is Mirko Garasic from Tel Aviv University and I'm Akash Singh Rator from the Lewis University in Rome. In attempting to understand enforced medical treatment in general, especially in relationship to criminality, responsibility, and other questions of moral and legal philosophy, the most important case that we can focus on is called the Singleton case. Singleton case is a United States death row case that began when in 1979, Charles Singleton killed a grocery clerk in the United States state of Arkansas and was subsequently sentenced to death that same year. Once living on death row, that is in prison awaiting the death penalty to be enacted, Singleton began taking psychotropic medications to alleviate the <clears throat> anxiety and depression that he was feeling. About a decade later, his mental health began deteriorating quite rapidly to the extent that he claimed that his victim whom he had murdered, was actually still alive, and that he himself was possessed by demons. Singleton was diagnosed as schizophrenic and prescribed antipsychotic medication. During the years following that, Singleton sometimes refused to take the medication, sometimes he agreed to take the medication. As a result, when he spontaneously refused to take it, it was forced upon him. When he went off the medication, the paranoid and delusional behaviors returned. By 1997, antipsychotic medication had become so necessary that the prison placed Singleton under an involuntary drugging regime, so he no longer had the choice of determining whether he would or would not take the medication. And the basis for putting him on an involuntary medical regime was, on the one hand, that when he was not on the medicine, he was a danger both to himself and to the guards and the other prisoners. And on the other hand, when he was on the medication, he was quite lucid and the results were, were very favorable. Under the medical regime, the enforced medical treatment, Singleton's mental health improved to such an extent that the state of Arkansas authorities considered him at that time eligible for execution scheduling the execution for March 2000. Now you have to realize that in order to be executed, you need to be competent and sane. At least that has been the prevailing norm, although certain Supreme Court cases have determined that the uh, bar for deciding who is competent can be determined very uh, laxly. In other words, mentally retarded people might be eligible for execution, while mentally ill people might not be uh, eligible for execution. So there's a great deal of, of controversy and unclarity on what constitutes competency for execution. And this is in some respects what we're going to try to narrow in on as the moral and legal philosophical problems that are represented by the Singleton case. When Singleton was told that he was now eligible to be executed as the enforced medical treatment regime over the last 10 years or so had taken such good effect, Singleton filed a petition for habeas corpus. That means that he wants to appear before a judge to plead a case. He contended that he was only competent because the medication he was being forced to take and that it was unconstitutional to force a person to take medication in order to raise his competence so that he was eligible for death. There's a clear perversity in that, that uh, without medication, I would not be competent enough to be executed, so I should be medicated, and the claim is that it's in my own interest to be medicated so that I can be put to death. So Singleton's case was uh, uh, accepted to be heard in front of the court and eventually certain uh, uh, decisions were made which we're going to discuss whether the decision was right and other ways to think about this uh, problem. 
Now, there are a number of prima facie problems that occur. How, if at all, can we evaluate the attainment of a satisfactory level of competence that would allow for execution? Exactly what state of mind, what level of competence do I have to be in in order to understand what is happening to me? Why should I have to understand what is happening to me? And who's going to determine that I am at the level of competence necessary in order to understand what is going to happen to me? Why should the state insist on curing a prisoner against his will if such an imposition would inevitably result in death? Would it not be more logical to execute the prisoner no matter what his mental state is at the time of execution instead of prolonging his agony? When we think through these prima facie problems that occur to us in relation to enforced medical treatment, in relation to uh, the death penalty, we should be clear on the conditions that permit the state or certain authorities to force medical treatment on prisoners. There are generally held to be three conditions that must be met. The first condition is that physicians must make every effort to ensure that the patient understands clearly the risks of not being treated. In other words, this helps the patient through the process of being forced his medication if the patient is told that if you do not take this medication, the risks to you and to others is extremely high. The second condition is the treatment which physicians propose must offer a realistic chance of significant improvement. There should be no point in forcing a person against his will to undergo medical treatment unless there is a realistic chance of significant improvement, improvement based on that medical treatment. The third condition is that there are reasonable expectations that the patient would consent retroactively. In other words, if we have a patient that's in a very poor mental condition who has not even the ability to consent and we force medical treatment on him because the first two conditions are met, in other words, we've taken every step we can to explain things clearly and that we have a reasonable, realistic chance of significant improvement, the, the third condition is that if that improvement occurs, we could reasonably expect that the person would say, oh yes, it's a good thing that that medication was given to me. It's a good thing because now I've reached a certain level of um, uh, mental health that I, uh, I appreciate and condone. Now, thinking about these three conditions, it's quite clear in the Singleton case that while the first one affected the first one, the first condition would have been met quite easily by the authorities. The, the psychotic episodes of Singleton were severe and he was uh, a danger to all around. How can we understand the fulfilling the second or the third? The second condition is that there should be a realistic chance of significant improvement. Well, indeed, how do we define significant improvement? There might be improvement in the person's mental health, but there will be no improvement in the person's physical health. In fact, the person will die as a result of this medical treatment. And the third one, that there are reasonable expectations that the patient will consent retroactively. Well, there's absolutely no reasonable expectation that a person would consent retroactively. In this case, knowing that he will be put to death would uh, clearly uh, preclude him from consenting and in fact being dead would make it impossible for him to consent. So enforced medical treatment has three grounds by which it is considered legal and morally justified by moral and political philosophers. In the Singleton case, two out of those three grounds are ambiguous or impossible and seem not to be met. Now let's move on to the idea of punishment. What is it that we are trying to do when we put somebody in prison or in this case uh, to death? The death penalty is extremely controversial internationally. Uh, the entire region of Europe has forbidden it, but the United States, as in this case, continues to practice it. And as we all know, India continues to practice it. The idea of punishment involved both in imprisonment and in um, uh, the death penalty, 
require certain preconditions. If the agent, that is the person who committed the crime, is not responsible for his actions, there would be no reason to re-establish the competency of the agent in order to justify either imprisonment or execution. So one of the crucial aspects of punishing somebody is establishing uh, uh, competence. Is the agent competent enough to be aware of the relationship between the crime committed, the act, and the punishment meted out? If the agent is considered to be a free-willing individual, then the competence of the agent becomes undeniably relevant to any assessment of the level of intentionality and consequently to the degree of guilt. This seems like a complicated uh, formulation, but you can understand it very clearly. If you know what you are doing, you are responsible for what you are doing. The more clarity you have about the action, let's say a crime in this case, the more degree of responsibility you have. And this is why in criminal law we divide things, uh, crimes, and in the, in, according to their intentions, such as first degree, second degree, or involuntary. Let's take an example. If I commit a crime, let's say I rob a bank, that might be a spontaneous act while I'm in the bank, the opportunity arises. In that case, it was not a premeditated uh, uh, event. It was not a premeditated crime. It was not something I spent weeks planning. If it were something I spent weeks planning, then my responsibility is certainly beyond doubt. But let's change the scenario a bit. What if I'm standing there, the clerk refuses to give me money because of some technicality, that my i-card is illegible or that there's some doubts about whether I'm the person that I claim to be. My blood pressure rises, we have some confrontations, and as a consequence, I simply grab the money from the clerk and run out of the bank. This is a very different scenario from a premeditated crime planning to rob the bank. And consequently, during the court trial, the level of punishment that is meted out to me will be determined in relationship to the circumstances that it was not a premeditated crime. However, I should be responsible for my behavior, so I can't get off scot-free just because I'm annoyed by a blank, uh, bank clerk. But there's another example altogether. What if at the time I'm in the bank, I'm in fact intoxicated or I am mentally ill or I have a psychotic episode? And as a consequence, I conduct an activity that is considered bank robbery. Well, in this case, the level of my competency is quite important to whether I committed a crime at all. In other words, if I didn't know what was right or wrong, if I didn't know what was crime or not crime, then how can I be punished? So my mental state is determinative of the punishment that's meted out. So this is what makes the distinction between what's called mens rea we can translate that as guilty mind, and actus reus, we can translate that as a guilty action, crucial in establishing the appropriate punishment in a sentence. So in my bank robbery example, the actus reus is the act of robbing a bank. A crime has occurred. But what is the mens reus? In my first suggestion that I had premeditated and planned this for weeks, watched the way the clerks come in and out of the bank, made notes, figured out exactly how to rob a bank. Mens rea is abundantly clear, and this would be considered a, 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 a highly culpable uh, crime. In the second case, where it just uh, erupts, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of spontaneous crime that occurs, once again, the actus reus is the same. Uh, the bank has been robbed, but the mens rea is diminished. In other words, I didn't walk in the bank with the intention to commit a crime. I walked into the bank with the intention to withdraw my money. Certain events happened, some outside of my control possibly, some within my control, and therefore the mens rea that leads to the actus reus is of a different level and consequently, the prosecutor, 
the, uh, the, the, the uh, police, the prosecution, the judge would treat me differently. My punishment would certainly be less than in the first case. We can divide that into two uh, parts. While my mens reus is less, nevertheless, should I not be responsible for my negligence, for allowing myself to become so passionate and hostile to do this criminal act. So while it's the mens reus might not be the intention of committing a crime, certainly there's an element of what we can call criminal negligence involved, and everybody would probably agree that we cannot let me off scot-free because I should have been in control of my emotions. In the third case, I have a psychotic episode. The actus reus remains. The bank has been robbed. But what is the mens reus? Not only is there no intentionality on my part to having committed a crime purposefully, nor is there negligence on my part, unless we could determine that I'm on a medical regime and the previous week I decided to stop taking the medicines. In that case, the psychotic episode in the bank could be held my responsibility. Nevertheless, the bank robbery as such would have to be considered in relationship to my negligence rather than my intention to commit crime. So these are the kinds of ways within which mens rea and actus reus get correlated. Now, when we are meeting out punishment, this becomes extremely important. There are two conditions required to justify punishment. The first regards conviction by the court. The criminal act must be established to be that of a responsible agent eligible for punishment. So I hope you see now that this uh, is, is an attempt to tie together the actus reus with, with the mens rea. The criminal act, the actus reus, must be established to be that of a responsible agent. In other words, my mens is Latin for mind. My mind should be in some way clear and eligible for punishment. The second condition is related to the court's sentence. The punishment must find its proportion to the criminal act, establishing the right price to be paid to society. So this falls more on the actus reus. What is it that I have done? Irrespective of my mens, my mind, my intentions, what is it that I have done? Let's say that without intending it, I perform some sort of an action that leads to the death of numerous innocent people. Well, the gravity of that crime might demand a severe punishment despite the fact that I had no intention to commit that crime. So let's say I had no intention to litter. Some, some rubbish just fell out of my pocket and the police finds me 500 rupees, 1000 rupees. Well, I might argue with the police officer, I had no intention to commit the crime, the mens rea was not there, and the actus reus, the crime itself, is not a very big deal. I can simply pick up the rubbish, put it in the dustbin. In that case, to mete out punishment would be disproportionate. But, accidentally, I lead to the death of numerous people, irrespective of my mens rea, some price must be paid for the action that I did. This is interesting because even in normal everyday social etiquette, we take a certain amount of responsibilities for our unintended actions. You can think of it as if you are walking down the street and you accidentally bump into a person. Uh, maybe that person's tea spills a little in his hand or, or something like this. Now, you had no intention to do it. It wasn't even your fault by any stretch of the imagination. Perhaps somebody bumped you. What do you say to that person whose who, uh, uh, tea has fallen on his shirt? You say, I'm sorry. Now, why should you be sorry if you had no intention to perform that action? The action was completely involuntary. Because there is always some sense in which we must pay a price for the act 
irrespective of our intention. With these two uh, principles of punishment correlated to the uh, mind and to the act, we should keep in mind something very crucial about competence. Competence is necessary for the entire idea of law to function. After all, if we don't know what the law is, then how can we be reasonably expected either to follow it or to not uh, accidentally break it? And everybody has heard the very common expression that derives from ancient Roman law, which is that ignorance of the law is not an excuse. The flip side of ignorance of the law not being an excuse is the demand upon the state to publish the law. So if we accept that ignorance of the law is not an excuse for individuals, then there must be the equal burden upon the state and the authorities to publish the law prominently and clearly so that we can not be ignorant of the law. If a law is hidden, how can the claim be made that ignorance of the law is no excuse? I didn't know that the law existed. If the laws are published prominently and uh, uh, ubiquitously, then obviously ignorance of the law is not an excuse. But something falls right in the middle of these two points, which is that I have to be competent to understand the law. So if there is no competency in if I have no competency or capacity, rational capacity, to understand what the dictates of the law are, then this legal system breaks down. This is why the possession of capacities and understanding is a condition for the efficacy of law. Well, how does it relate to the Singleton case? Here it's problematic because as I had explained earlier, at the time that Singleton committed the crime, that murder in the state of Arkansas, at the time that he was convicted of that crime, the same year in Arkansas, and sentenced to death, throughout this period, he was fully competent, aware of the crime, aware of the magnitude of the crime, and aware of the proportionality of the punishment to the crime, at least according to a retributive idea that if you kill in cold blood, then the state can take your life. That we know is open to question, but this is a retributive idea of justice that is applicable in the United States and in India as well. The problem arises with the Singleton case is that there's a great deal of time that intervenes before the sentence of death and the execution itself. And within this intervening period, Singleton's competence has clearly come into question. So much so that he believes that he didn't commit the crime because the victim is still alive. And he believed that if he committed the crime, it's because he was possessed by demons. So the uh, mens rea has clearly broken down in every respect. What should we do then? What are the possible choices in the Singleton case? Let me tell you what the state of Arkansas did in fact do. The judgment was that in relation to Singleton's claim of habeas corpus that he shouldn't be uh, medicated in order to be subjected to death. The federal court decided that it is acceptable to medicate, to force medical treatment upon Singleton in order to carry out the execution. And that once the medical treatment is proven effective enough to establish competence, and that competence should be decided by psychiatrists and physicians, then the state should immediately act to execute him. And this, in fact, happened in the year 2000. Singleton was forced antipsychotic medication, medication for schizophrenia. He was forced to take it under duress. He always had responded very well to that medicine. And psychiatrists conducted interviews and tests and decided this man is now competent, sane, rational. And they immediately injected him with uh, poisons under the, uh, uh, the style of execution called lethal injection, and he was put to death. What do we think about this? Given that, as I had mentioned before, 
the usual conditions under enforcing medical treatment, the three conditions that I had mentioned, two of them were in doubt. This case has raised a great deal of debate amongst legal philosophers and moral philosophers. What are the alternatives? What else could have been done? A sustained legal philosophical treatment of this case, the consequences and the alternative decisions that the court could have reached, is found in a book by the legal philosopher Barry Latzer. Latzer suggests that there are three ways, three decisions that could have come about, three alternative ways to deal with the case. Note that in each of them, retributivism is taken as a basic ground. It's not in dispute. By retributivism, remember that I mean that if a crime is committed, punishment must be meted out. So uh, uh, there's re the, the idea of justice here is retribution. You did something wrong, you must pay a price. So this is a retributive uh, suggestion. There are alternative theses about or positions about criminality. In other words, uh, Gandhi, for example, had a rehabilitative notion. So the idea is not to simply punish someone uh, retribution, it is rehabilitative. In other words, we're not interested in punishment, we're interested in rehabilitating this person such that he knows more clearly the reasons not to do wrong. But in this argument, the retribution principle remains foundational. So given that, what are the three alternatives that we have? We have option A, medicate and execute. And indeed, this is what was done. The state carries out the standard procedure of execution after having forcibly medicated the inmate and restored the inmate to the minimal level of competence necessary. B. Don't medicate, but what does that mean then? Don't execute, because we know that some basic minimal level of competence is required for the retribution argument to work. I mean, otherwise we could just execute people in their sleep. The execution of the death sentence is postponed indefinitely until the competence is restored either by unforeseeable factors or by autonomous decision by the prisoner to undergo treatment. In other words, we leave it to the autonomy of the prisoner to decide, will I take medication? We can't force medication onto the prisoner. Consequently, we can't execute unless two miraculous thing, things, one of two miraculous things occur suddenly restored to sanity. That seems unlikely. Alternatively, the person decides, you know what, I want to be medicated so I can be put to death. That seems equally unlikely. So option B, don't medicate, don't execute. Option C, medicate, but don't execute. Now, what could that possibly mean? What this means is that we are trying to make those three conditions that are necessary in order to enforce medical treatment to actually all three come true. You remember that in this case, it hardly seems likely that the function of medication is in the best interest of the medicated. After all, this person is going to die. So what would happen under this scenario C is that the state bargains with the inmate saying, please let us medicate you because this is in your best interest and the best interest of the prisoners and the police who are guarding you. And in exchange, we will downgrade your punishment from death to a life sentence. This seems a very humane uh, approach. And at first glance, this might be the approach that um, any of us would spontaneously come to. But think of this problem that it's attached to it. It leaves all other prisoners on death row in the strange position of wishing that they become demented. Now, this is not fair to all of the prisoners on death row if somebody through strange, we have to call it luck in this case, though mental insanity seems a most misfortunate thing, through some strange luck, this person gets out of the death sentence because of going insane, and it, would, it, it seems like an injustice to all other prisoners on death row. Latzer doesn't consider a fourth option, which we are going to consider in this um, in this uh, module, because actually we feel that the previous three uh, options, A, B, and C, are each equally problematic. 
A is problematic because the, the claims that we are enforcing medical treatment for the good of the prisoner are obviously false. A might be acceptable if we were to publicly declare, if the authorities publicly declared that this medical treatment is not enforced for the sake of the prisoner, it's enforced for the sake of retributive justice, but neither the actual court nor the declarations at the time of execution came to this conclusion. That conclusion would also largely throw into question the medical ethics of those practitioners, psychiatrists and doctors, who are injecting forcibly a, one of their patients whom it's their medical obligation to treat with medicines in order to lead to their death. With B, we have the problem of uh, lack of uh, retribution for the uh, crime committed. In other words, this, irrespective of the mens rea, a murder has occurred and uh, there must be some punishment meted out for it. In C, the uh, injustice to other death row prisoners is there. So there are clear problems with all A, B, and C, even though the legal philosopher Latzer concludes that A was not only the legally sound argument, but the morally sound argument, and therefore he sides with the opinion of the court, and he's in agreement with what happened to Singleton, which is that he was forced into competence through medicine by psychiatrists and then executed. So what alternative could there be? The alternative we'll call D, which is don't medicate and nevertheless execute. If the evaluation of the culpability of the agent doesn't take into account the mens rea, in other words, if we're committing this um, execution because of the gravity of the crime and not exclusively because of the intention behind it, then why should the resulting punishment be directed towards a restoration of the mental state that did not even figure in the equation leading to the death sentence in the first place? In other words, the idea here is that we have to get Singleton's mind back into capacity so he understands that he committed a crime for which he must suffer the death penalty. But the argument here is that if the death penalty is largely a consequence of simply the act, that is, that somebody was murdered, and not so much the mentality behind it, that there was an intention to murder, then why do we find it necessary to raise Singleton's competence back into that mental status that he can be aware of the consequences of his action? There could be an equally persuasive argument that let him just be mentally unsound because the act of putting him to death satisfies the retributive justice principles. In other words, if the actus reus is the only factor that counts in the equation when assessing the punishment, so it should be accepted that there would be no more moral or legal justification to restore the mental conditions presumed by mens rea, not previously taken into account in establishing guilt. So this is a reformulation of the very same thing. We're putting this person to death because of what he did, not because of what he intended to do. And consequently, why do we need to raise his level of mental capacity to such an extent that he understands uh, what he did? The actus reus is important. So this is an argument for a fourth alternative. Don't medicate, but do execute. To sum up, all of the three options, A, B, and C, used by Latzer to legitimize the legal and moral acceptability of the decision taken in the Singleton case are unsatisfactory on both legal and moral grounds. Arguments can be made that each of them has legal and moral problems. The only reason for the enforced medical treatment is has been based on its political value. The need to reestablish competence is only desirable for the authorities to not permit a soft message to filter out. In other words, this is the point of the death penalty. We are making an example of this criminal in order to dissuade countless other people from engaging in this action. If that's the case, why do we need to raise the level of competence of Singleton
in order to undergo the execution. It might be equally plausible simply to let him be as he is so that we're not violating his autonomy and forcing medical treatment upon him and yet undergo the punishment for a number of other reasons related to criminal justice and the relationship between crime and punishment. Thank you.